My name is Bella Glanville, and you might recognize me from shows such as Celebs Go Virtual Dating, where I made it to the finale and won Pete Wicks' heart. But I'm also a psychologist and a motivational writer. And after seeing the title of this talk, you might be thinking, this girl is an expert on online dating, and she's going to teach us the secret to cracking the algorithm. Well, think again, because this entire talk is about why the algorithm is rubbish. <laughs> I was the only virtual date that Pete had throughout the show, yet he still chose me. And there are a couple of scientific theories that could explain why he preferred me to the in-person dates. When you meet someone online, the characteristics that limit you from getting into relationships in real life aren't there. And this is called the absence of gating. Shyness, awkwardness, an irritating sneeze, these are all things that aren't present online. But the problem is that we fill in the gaps of who we think someone is, and we make them out to be our definition of a dream partner. But people fool us, and these gaps that we fill in aren't always accurate. An American study actually found that online daters present a more socially desirable self and even steal other people's profile ideas. We also might prefer the people that we meet online because of the strangers on a train effect. And there's been so much research about this. You're more likely to open up to a stranger on a train or say maybe a hairdresser because you can trust that the information won't get out to people that you know. In the same way, you're more likely to open up to people that you don't know online. And a Skype study found that people prefer dates that they can have a deep, intimate conversation with. In fact, uh, the conversation that I had on my first celebrity virtual date was very deep, which probably stood out from the usual somewhat fruity talk and humorous dates that you get on that show. <laughs> There's also a biological basis behind why people like to talk about themselves. Psychologists Tamara and Mitchell found that when we do, there's an increased MRI activity in the brain regions associated with reward. And speaking of reward, what was my reward for making it to the finale of that dating show? Well, we never saw each other again. <laughs> Online dating has changed the game of relationships. Nowadays, if you don't like the relationship that you're in, you can just swipe left and get a new one. And a one-night stand is now at the end of people's fingertips. The instant fix of a Tinder match or scrolling through porn sites gives instant gratification. But is it truly as gratifying as old-fashioned courtship? Is the catch not more thrilling when you've earned the thrill of the chase? Our attention spans are becoming shorter, and conditions like ADHD are escalating. It's so easy now to switch and change between jobs and women and lifestyle that Generation Z feel no reason to settle for fidelity or loyalty. And that's why this generation includes less people who want a monogamous relationship. We have this notion of entitlement and we want it all, but the lack of depth in our goals and life choices leaves us forever wanting more. So now, if we're sitting on a Tinder date, we're more likely to sit there and think about who we can swipe right on next that's better than the person we're already sitting with. So we see potential partners now as more disposable, because the attention span of society is becoming so much shorter. In fact, a recent study found that only 50% of people on Tinder will meet up with one of their matches. That being said, another study found 72% of people with internet access to be in a relationship, whereas only 36% of people without internet access were in a relationship. Online dating has displaced the original ways of meeting a partner. Instead of meeting a potential partner, getting a snapshot impression of how well you interact with them, and then slowly learning facts about them over time, online dating typically involves learning a broad range of facts about a potential partner before deciding whether or not you want to meet them in person. But is this a good thing? My friend was talking to a guy throughout lockdown, and as they legally couldn't meet in person, they just voice noted every day and eventually had a seven hour phone call. Seven hours. So he passed the absence of gating test, he passed the disposability test, 
But by the time they were able to meet in person, they had nothing left to talk about. And that's why people who match on these apps often don't meet in person at all. The boom and bust theory. Because of the strangers on a train effect, boom, people on these apps get really close really fast because they open up to each other. But they don't know the other person well enough yet to give them the trust that they need to hold and sustain their information. And that causes the relationship to bust. So what does it take to go from matching on these apps to actually meeting in person? Is it attractiveness, what job they have, or is it something even more shallow? Well, an Italian study actually assessed people on dating apps and found that they were more likely to respond to each other's messages if they were equal in attractiveness. But in the Skype study that I mentioned earlier, people preferred dates who were more attractive than them. So this is another problem that online dating has created for us. We can't fall in love with people based off their personalities anymore. They have to pass the attraction test first. In real life, women have been found to care more about job status and wealth, and men have been found to care more about physical attractiveness because it shows the women to be more healthy and therefore fertile. But online, this all gets thrown out the window. A YouTube experiment set up two Tinder profiles of a man and a woman, both equal in attractiveness, both with identical discovery settings. They then swiped right on 1,000 people, and a day later, the male account had 269 matches, whereas the female account had 701. So the match rate of the female account was 43% higher than the one of the male. So there's significant gender disparity when it comes to the importance of physical attractiveness on dating apps. And as I said, this is different in real life, where personality makes a huge difference. In fact, in another study, a man and a woman met their Tinder matches wearing a fat suit. Four out of five of the men took off when they saw the women, whereas all of the women stayed and got to know the man. So what these studies have shown us is that online, women care more about superficial attractiveness, whereas in person, it's the men. And the algorithms of these dating apps don't take into account the differences between what each gender prefers, even if it doesn't represent what we prefer in real life. Are our virtual preferences just completely different to the ones we have in person? And are they successful in helping us find a long-term partner? Well, in America alone, it's been found that only 12% of the people who use these apps have found committed relationships from them. There's actually no compelling evidence that the mathematical algorithms of these dating apps work. And there's also no evidence that they lead to more romantic outcomes than those created by relationships formed elsewhere. Not only do these algorithms leave out things such as personality, they don't take into account the differences between each person on these dating apps, and they don't take into account how each relationship will develop over time. So these algorithms were only created for a short-term initial attraction. When it comes down to it, everywhere we go, people are looking for love. Think about it. How many times have you been in a grocery store, made eye contact with someone, and automatically been convinced that they're the love of your life? A movie, no matter the genre, always tends to include a romantic plot. And this seems to be reflected in our lives too. So it was only a matter of time before romance hit the internet. In fact, <clears throat> I've actually been asked out a number of times on LinkedIn, <laughs> true story. But here's the paradox. Has the internet ruined romance or simply made it easier? What will the future hold? Will romantic tales be turned into stories of meaningless hookups? Will Cinderella become Tinderella? Or do we just need to search for that faithful 12%? So who knows? whether I would have made it to the finale of that dating show had our first date been in person. 
Who knows whether a virtual relationship might boom or bust? But what we do know is that by 2035, the UK has been predicted to reach its tipping point with more than 50% of relationships beginning online. Online dating has changed the relationship game forever. Thank you.